welcome to our Ask the Sheriff blog. This is our new blog at the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. My name is Samantha Cargus. I'm the Public Information Officer here. And we have, obviously, Sheriff Billy Hansel with us today. Um, and you guys asked some really great questions on Facebook for us. And we're going to try to answer those to the best of our ability. If we miss a few, um, don't worry. We'll get to them at the next blog. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right. So some let's, good questions today. Yeah, let's get started. Um, okay. So the first section I've kind of broken it up to is a community engagement okay. slash crime prevention. That's something that's really been on people's minds. Absolutely. So what can the community do to help ex-felons reintegrate back into society? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now in our correctional facility, we have a programs-based um, philosophy. So we want to uh, lower the recidivism rate when someone comes into custody and we want to make sure that they have classes, they have um, um, drug treatment, everything they need to build them up when they get out of custody. And so right now there's several great um, actual uh, drug treatment centers. And uh, there's also some, um, some centers like Teen Challenge. Uh, we are at uh, Club 517, which is the coffee shop um, that Teen Challenge has on, uh, on 2nd Street and uh, support places like that. Rescue Mission, Betty Chin Center, uh, Waterfront Recovery, um, those kind of places that really are trying to help people with their drug problem and, and getting them back on their feet. And so having the public support those things are, is very, very important. Supporting local programming. Absolutely. Great. Local programming is very, very important because one thing is we want to make sure that people, you know, once they're out of custody, that they're supported. Mm -hmm. and, um, because people don't spend a lot of time in jail anymore because of our overcrowding issue. So we want to make sure that uh, there's other places for them to go when they get out of custody. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. All right, next question. Okay. Uh, if we are aware of people who are lurking in our communities and suspect them of property crime, how do we get that information to you? Yeah, so one thing that's very, very important is that if you see a crime in progress, that you call 911. So if someone is prowling around your neighborhood, someone's yeah. looking into cars, those kind of things, then make sure that you call 911 and report those things. Give yeah. a description, a direction, travel, those kind of things. If you just suspect that people are, are you know, in your neighborhood, that there's bikes piling up, that there may be you know, thieves, those kind of things, mm -hmm. then uh, call us. Uh, call our, our main number, 445-7251. <coughs> And, uh, and they can you know, take an anonymous tip there, or you can call our tip line at 268-2539, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you can give us that information, and, uh, and we can make sure that information is passed on to the, to the right deputies that work that area to make sure that you know, we can kind of stop that. We don't like thieves. We don't like people prowling in our area. <laughs> Everyone's been a victim of it here in Humboldt County, and uh, so we want to make sure that um, you know, to kind of reduce that. Yeah, and another big thing that we've been pushing lately is Neighborhood Watch um, and the benefits of starting that Neighborhood Watch, getting to know your neighbors That's again. That's right. Um, so that could definitely help as well. Absolutely, yeah. Neighborhood Watch is so important when we talk about um, trying to prevent those issues from happening uh, in your neighborhood. So uh, if you haven't started a Neighborhood Watch or you want to start one in the county, uh, please call us, 445-7251, and we can help you get one started. This is probably my favorite question. Can I join the team? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? We're always hiring. So right now we're hiring correctional deputies, deputy sheriffs, dispatchers, animal control officers. And uh, really we have uh, a lot of, of potential here in the department of, of trying to join our team. Uh, we have a great atmosphere at the sheriff's office. It is a team. We all help each other out. And uh, it's a part of, uh, of creating the, 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 the greater good in the community. Uh, a lot of people are critical of our county uh, about all the problems, but you know what? There's a lot of good things that are happening, and uh, law enforcement is one of those things right now. And so we are working together uh, now more than ever with the Reese Police Department, Arcata, Fortuna, um, Ferndale, Rio Dell, and CHP. So all these all these agencies are working so well together that we want to continue that, and you can be a part of our team at the Sheriff's Office. Yes, you can. HumboldtGov.org uh, slash sheriff, and you can find out more information about that one. What is your best method for combating or preventing property crime? So that is Neighborhood Watch. So one thing is you want to prevent uh, the crime from occurring. So that means making sure that uh, you don't store anything in your vehicle overnight. You know, never leave your purse in the car. Never leave um, boxes or anything valuable in the car because it just makes these serial thieves 
um, you know, who are lurking in the area, are constantly looking for things to, to, to rapidly take to, and, and, and sell, don't be a victim of that. Leave nothing in the car, keep your car locked at all times, and also keep your doors locked. The best thing also is make sure that you have proper lighting around your house. Proper lighting is is, is good, um, and if you can afford cameras, it's also a benefit. It's a deterrent. There's a lot of people that have different technology that's helping them out, motion sensors, um, and making sure that you you know cut the brush around your house. And then also, just the main thing too, call us. We have people that are are mostly doing um, lots of neighborhood uh, uh, residential burglaries during the daytime. So they are lurking around, knocking on doors and then find out no one's home and then going into a backyard. If you see someone that's lurking around, call us and then we can do something about it. How can we help ensure the safety of domestic violence victims as they work through the process of getting a restraining order? Yeah, so we are working with uh, um, with a lot of different agencies to try and help victims of domestic violence. It is a very, very sensitive issue. Um, I know there's a lot of forms of domestic violence and that a lot of times people don't feel like they can leave their... Um, look at that activity here. Um, so people feel like they can't leave their relationship because of um, economic reasons, uh, because of children, and those kind of things. So it's, it makes it very, very difficult, but uh, we have a partnership with Humble Domestic Violence um, and, uh, and these are people that want to help victims of domestic violence. And uh, so we want to make sure that um, and once, um, once someone is identified that they want help, there are avenues to protect them. There are safe houses to bring them to. And also, once there is a case that's being prosecuted, the DA has a victim witness um, uh, unit that they can actually assist people in getting restraining orders and helping them through the process and make sure they go to court mm -hmm. and, and help them along the way. But it takes a, a very brave person to come forward and, and want to go through this process. And, uh, and we will support them 110%. What's the best slash most important things community members can do to support you in your efforts? Great. Um, we like what, this question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, community engagement. And uh, I, we're very, very fortunate, I think, in Humboldt County because we do receive a lot of support from our community. Yeah. And uh, no matter what we're doing, we feel like uh, we're supported by our community. They passed the tax measure in 2014 to help us with hiring. Uh, we have 40 people that were that are part of that public safety tax, and so it's made a huge impact out there on the street. Um, and so I think calling, trusting us, trusting the process um, is really something that we want to continue to engage the, the public with. Also, looking at the laws that are being passed in California, right now it has been... Um, the state has been passing laws after laws that reduce the crime accountability. And so a lot of felonies have been reduced to misdemeanors. And so being a, paying attention to the legislature on a state level and on a local level, we do not want to um, uh, hold law enforcement back more when it comes to our ability to enforce the law. Um, you know, So a lot of people are concerned about the drug epidemic and uh, with Prop 47 and 57, a lot of those crimes were reduced to misdemeanors and, and it's taken that accountability away. So make sure you pay attention to things that are going on the state level. Interact with your state senators. Uh, Mike McGuire is uh, is a great state senator and he is very, very attentive to hear things on the local level. And same with our assemblyman, Jim Wood. They have local offices. Just keep in contact with them. Making sure that you're aware of things are on the state level and then if they don't hear from you, a lot of times they think that you're okay with a new law being passed. So be in contact with them. Make sure they're aware of of how we feel in Humboldt County and how these laws will do affect us. And definitely voting. I mean, some people don't realize the consequences of inaction. So if you, you didn't vote for or against one of these propositions, well, that could have, you know, caused these circumstances. So Very much so. Voting is very, very important. So I urge you to continue to vote. Yeah. Thank you. Get educated and vote. November's <laughs> coming up. Operations and training. Okay. Uh, also, first of all, I don't think a lot of people in the community understand what operations means for the sheriff's office. Could you okay. just briefly touch on that? Operations, so these are the, the boots on the ground. Um, these are the deputy sheriffs that are out there every day answering calls for service. Uh, we have about 110 deputies, but really only a, um, 
about half that are actually work in the street and um, because we have a lot of other ancillary duties that we do. And uh, so we have deputies that uh, are responsive all over the county um, and answering 911 calls, neighborhood complaints, um, and you know, again, thanks to the public safety uh, tax, we have 24-hour coverage in most areas of the county. But, um, so that is all operations. Somebody wants to know a little bit about how we are trained. And particularly, I think what they're touching on is use of force. So okay. when is it, when are we trained to fire a weapon? And yeah. when, you know, what are those options that we're taught? Yeah, so use of force is something that is, it's been a, a topic of discussion lately because the state legislature was looking at passing a law, it was uh, AB 931, um, that was looking at restricting an officer's ability to use force and mm -hmm. using force only when it was necessary um, in, in the, I guess, the eyes of other people. And the fact is that the Supreme Court has, has made it um, the law and the interpretation of law that, that each officer has to use the force that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and and at the time, and all the facts known to that officer at that time, that's what they're going to be judged on. Mm -hmm. And uh, because a lot of times using a deadly force, I mean, it is a it's something that no law enforcement officer is looking forward to. It is something that is a tragic event, taking someone's life or having a deadly force encounter where you're protecting your life or the life of someone else is a very very serious matter. Mm -hmm. And so right now the law is in place. That, that we um, use that force only you know, when it's reasonable at the time, and again, only when it's protecting our lives or someone else, or there's an imminent threat of loss of life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's all based upon that training. Uh, you know, we train so much in this, in these snaps, you know, these, these, these uh, split-second judgments, mm -hmm. and then um, a lot of people you know, want to say, well, why don't you just shoot someone in the leg? You know, why do you have to shoot them in an area that, you know, uh, that basically kills a person and uh, and so we are trained to shoot to stop the threat And so if someone's holding a firearm holding a knife actively assaulting someone You know we are shooting in an area that stops the threat and that's where we're training and, and they're accountable for every bullet that's fired right. and and so they have to justify every time you squeeze the trigger so that's something that that is and we take it very very serious someone wants to know whether or not we reuse our gloves we use our latex gloves? Yeah, okay. so when they're, you know, dealing no, with... <laughs> no, we don't reuse our latex gloves. I mean, unless there's multiple people, you know, at at a scene where we just glove up once and we're searching a bunch of people, you know, we have latex gloves that we issue our deputies. And so it's something that with all the communicable diseases and all the, the people that we uh, deal with on a daily basis, they're using a lot of gloves. Yeah. And uh, and so it's, it's something that's just a part of the job now. Yeah, definitely. Will there be more law enforcement staffing to help patrol since it appears crime in Humboldt is increasing? I think this might be a tribute to Measure O, how that's helping us. Yeah, so Measure O is the new tax measure that's going to be on the ballot in November. Um, it continues Measure Z um, and that public safety tax. And that has helped out tremendously. Uh, there is more, there's more of, of a push now than ever to put deputies on the street. And that, again, I've, I've said it for the last five years that I've had this, this job and being a part of the sheriff's office that, you know, having a patrol deputy in the area is the number one crime deterrent. Mm -hmm. It really is having that rapid response there. We have a very supportive board of supervisors that mm -hmm. uh, controls the budget for the sheriff's office. And so their priority too is to maintain that street level deputy sheriff that's responsible to 911 calls and 24-hour coverage. So, um, so contacting your board of supervisors, ensuring that that's still a priority is all, always appreciated. Yeah, definitely. And speaking of 24-hour coverage, I mean, in the last four years, overnight has been an incredible difference. I mean, we've gone from five or six deputies for the whole county that's right. for the period of 8 p.m. to 2 p.m. to 17 deputies during that time frame. Yeah. Like, it's crazy. It's it great. is. It is. It is very, very. It's. It's great. I think people have seen the difference. I mean, and uh, and people say, well, why does that benefit Eureka? Why does that benefit McKinleyville? Because, you know, the deputies that were based out of McKinleyville and Eureka were called to Southern Humboldt. They're called to Eastern Humboldt right. when there was a priority call, and so it just keeps the resources close to where the. Um, where their beat is. And so we have people working in Garberville, we have people working in Willow Creek, and we have our resident deputies, you know, in Orleans, Bridgeville, uh, Oric, um, and um, Hoopa area. 
and we are, we are very optimistic that we'll fill that last one at Shelter Cove here in the next six months. So, yeah, so we're very, very optimistic. About that. Yes. Why don't you have somebody patrolling the marinas for people who are speeding slash breaking the no wake zones on the bay? Yeah, so we do. We actually have a marine deputy. We have two deputies that are actually out there. Um, you know, several hours a week that are in a patrol boat that are looking for those kind of violations. And they do cite and they do, you know, warn people. But the, the goal is that, you know, they're there. Uh, we don't have uh, regular hours or only there on Friday or something like that. They're patrolling um, all week and um, in various different times to, to make sure that that level of coverage is there. We will respond to you know, the boating accidents there in the bay or on rivers, and uh, it's a part of being a, a boating deputy here at the Sheriff's Office. So it is a full-time position, and, uh, and we have dedicated personnel for that reason. Many law enforcement agencies use reserve deputies or officers. Does this office have any plans for a reserve deputy program? Yeah, that's a great program. And we did have one in the past at the Sheriff's Office, and there's other agencies locally that have reserve programs. It is something that I want to get started. It's something that uh, would benefit the community. These are the facts, though, that uh, a person who wants to be a reserve deputy has to go through about 150 hours of training. And, uh, and right now there is module three at the, at the at the basic police academy that people can take mm -hmm. to be a level three reserve and um but that that's twice a year but that's again about a month commitment that they would have to go to school um i'm interested in, in maybe reaching out to the the uh, redwoods police academy and see if they're interested in doing a weekend course or a night course to see if people would be interested in that and if you are interested i encourage you to call the college redwoods and tell them you're interested in that but it's definitely a great program for the community to be involved in to be a level three reserve and that means you'd be riding along with another deputy and that you would help make arrests and help write reports and be responsive and you'd be that second man in a car and uh so it would, it's something that definitely is a, is a good thing. And just uh, along those same lines, we also have an extra help program incorporating some of our retired deputies yeah. and also looking for some um, law enforcement from other agencies who want to be extra help. Can you just talk a little bit about extra help? Yeah, right now we do because uh, in the Sheriff's Office, we have a lot of coverage areas, yeah. a lot. <laughs> so we have the courts to deal with, we have airport security, um, and so there's a lot of ancillary duties that we actually hire retired law enforcement officers, um, uh, law enforcement officers from other agencies that, that want to help and, uh, and, and work in the extra help capacity. So, so if people are interested in that, then please call us at 445-7251 and, uh, and ask to speak with the staff lieutenant and, um, or, or the operations lieutenant. And, um, and so they'll be able to, to talk to them about that. So it's definitely a worthwhile program. Okay, and I think I can answer this one a little bit. What happened to the calls for service reports that were online? Um, yeah, Sam, what happened to the calls for service reports that yeah. were online? So Good we question. are transitioning to a new reporting system called RIMS, and it is going to be fantastic for all. It's really going to help everyone here at our agency um, make better reports clearer. We can track things better. Um, and so part of that is the calls for service logs are a result of our record software. So we're going to take a little break for about a month, look at how RIMS is going to produce those call for services logs, see what we can, the best information that we can get you through those logs. So those will be back, Yes. but not quite yet. Yeah, the best thing about, about our, uh, our new system that we're going to is that uh, there is a citizen RIMS component. I think Fortuna and Eureka Police Department currently has that, and it's something that you're going to be able to see you know, crime data and, and what we are doing in your area. And uh, it's going to be very, very beneficial, I think, for that public information aspect of going out there. And, um, mm -hmm. and so it's, um, it'll benefit everyone by us going to the system. And then the, also the great benefit that uh, we're going to be able to share information between all the different uh, police departments in the county. So Arcata, Eureka, Fortuna, Humboldt State University, um, Rio Dell, and, and uh, we're trying to find a way to get Ferndale online with that as well. Um, but all of us can share information and uh, to really gather what we need because we know that these, these criminals that take advantage of people they don't just pay attention to the municipal boundaries or the county you know, right. jurisdiction. They go across the lines, and so we're dealing with the same 
you know, people back and forth. Sure. Yeah. When would something be considered the sheriff's office, and when would be it Highway Patrol? Highway Patrol patrols the uh, state highways. It's their primary jurisdiction. They take traffic accidents. They do traffic calming. They do, um, obviously, the primary and traffic enforcement. Um, so if there's ever any traffic accidents, that's what they deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, they also deal with the road rage type incidents uh, that occur. Um, but any other any of the other crimes, also DUIs, reckless driving, those kind of things, they deal they deal with that on a regular basis. Or any crimes that occur within state buildings, they also are responsive to that. Um, but anything that is a crime, a penal code violation, um, you know, we will get that phone call and that we will follow up with that. And um, so. Uh, but just safe that when you see a crime, no matter what it is, call 911 on your cell phone and that uh, it may go to the sheriff's office, it may go to CHP, it may go to a municipal jurisdiction. The dispatcher is very good at triaging those calls and figuring out what jurisdiction this needs to go to and, um, and then we'll figure it out. So don't let it hinder you. If you don't know who to call, you know, when it's in progress crime, 911 and we'll figure it out. What accomplishment are you most proud of? We've done a lot in, um, I think, in the last five years uh, that I've been a part of the Sheriff's Office. And uh, I think that what I'm most proud of is, is actually pushing more information out about what our deputy sheriffs do on a daily basis. You know, our deputies have, I think, always done a great job with being community-based police officers. Mm -hmm. And I think sharing the stories on a daily basis, I think, is something that I'm most proud of because our deputies do a fantastic job. It is an impossible job nowadays. And, uh, and I'm not just talking about the deputies on the street, I'm talking about the deputies in the jail too. Mm -hmm. On a daily basis, these deputies are doing an outstanding job, filling the need, filling the void um, mm -hmm. that society has created and, um, and that we are there to answer the call. And I just really, really appreciate the fact that we're telling that story now. I like it too, that's part of my job, so. Well, it's, job. <laughs> it's definitely fun. I get to see the, the happy side of things. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an important thing for people to remember is deputies oftentimes deal with people's worst days. That's right. And that's something I learned, you know, yeah. coming into this job was that, wow, I mean, they they are incredible yeah. people. Whenever yes. I see them, they're still happy and exactly. smiling and, you know, kind and compassionate. And, that is yeah. very, very true. And that I think that's, that's that is very, very important is, is and you know, I want to just keep highlighting that there is a lot of people behind this badge here, you know, it, and that, you know, we have uh, uh, just, uh, we are all part of this community. We want to see it, uh, make, you know, make this community a better place and be a part of that solution. So uh, I'm proud of our deputy sheriffs, our dispatchers, all the support services uh, that go along with it. And, um, and so it's just, uh, it's great being a part of this team. All right, the political reform now. Okay. So this is the last uh, couple questions here. Okay. Well, uh, political reform can be a lengthy topic, so we'll just keep it summarized. Hmm. It's you a know, cue. We'll, okay. we'll keep it summarized Sounds there. Good. Okay. What changes locally need to be made to give you more freedom to reduce crime in our area? Yeah. It needs to be on the state level. So the fact is that a sheriff's office in the past has been that... Um, that, uh, that jurisdiction that is able to take care of those public nuisance type issues. Our jail has now become a mini prison. We are housing serious and violent felons. There's people that, that um, refuse to obey their probation terms and, and that can't integrate into society. So those people are in our jail. And, and AB 109 has created a situation where it's more people in our jail ever before, and they can be sentenced to multiple years in our county jail. And our county jail was built 20 some odd years ago, and it was designed only to house people for a year. It's not a prison, it's not a yard, it, you know, it doesn't have all those things that a state prison does. Mm -hmm. And so it is something that uh, I'm, you know, uh, I, it's, it's, it's an impossible task that the state has given us. So. Um, one thing that I would love for people to do is pay attention to Sacramento. Pay attention to the crimes that, the crimes, the laws that are being passed nowadays and that makes it more difficult for us. And, um, and also, you know, I don't want to also take my ability away to work with my federal partners. Right now, there's a sanctuary ordinance that's, that's on the ballot. Um, and it basically is all about uh, me and my ability to work with ICE, right? And the state has already passed a sanctuary bill. It's SB 54. I think everyone should read that. It had some, some specific language in there. It was things that we were already doing here at the sheriff's office. And, um, and so um, it has, um, so 
ice to clear the water, clear the air on this. So ice comes into Humboldt County because every person that's booked into Humboldt County gets their fingerprint scanned. And that scan goes to Homeland Security and, and ICE. Right. And so they know everyone is in our jail. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a previously deported felon or someone that is in the country illegally and they're committed a, a past serious or violent felony or they're in custody for a serious or violent felony, when those persons are released, when they're released, then communication with ICE is is you know is made and then they're able to come pick them up on their release date. Okay, we don't hold them beyond their release date. We don't, you know, do any of that stuff. And then ICE can pick them up and then put them through a proceeding. And so um, that I think is what's best for Humboldt County. It gives us the ability to take care of people that really don't integrate into society. And um, and so in it in for Texas, we are not immigration officers. We will never ask for an immigration status. Mm -hmm. We will never ask for any of that stuff. And and none of our information will go to ICE, you know, because they don't know who's a citizen or not. Because we don't have an we don't have the ability to track that in our records management system. So so yeah. So that's short you know, version of that short question. Short version of that question. Yeah, question. Sorry. What steps, if any, are you taking to overturn the positions that undermine your work? Yeah. So. Uh, right now, I'm very, very busy with talking to our you know, state legislators, and like I said before, Senator McGuire and, and Assemblyman Wood are very, very attentive, to, and they, they, they take my phone call on a regular basis. They have a great local staff, and so I'm constantly communicating with them about legislation that I think is, is bad legislation. This AB 931, we contacted them with, on them on that, um, and also I'm a part of the State Sheriff's uh, Association, and we have, um, we're constantly in Sacramento trying to change change some of those laws and trying to get, um, trying to make sense and, and to educate our, our, our people that are, are in the state legislature, um, in the state senate, in the governor's office, to try and let them know that these are the consequences to certain, certain state, state laws, or, or these are the unintended consequences, you know, from passing uh, certain laws. So we want to make sure that that uh, that our voice is heard, and I make sure that it's, it is heard on a regular basis. Last question here. The Ninth Circuit recently ruled it's legal to carry loaded, open carry firearms in public. Can you confirm this? Uh, so, no. Uh, so the Ninth Circuit did, but that was a Hawaii case, and so that had just specific, you know, to Hawaii and an open carry law that was in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and so the Ninth Circuit covers Hawaii, covers California, um, and uh, so it is something that we're looking at, uh, but it does not change state law, does not change our, our our current laws about open carry and those kind of things. So, so yeah, so please don't open carry in public. Um, that you know, uh, will. We'll, find you, you know, maybe a little bit in trouble. Um, we do have a concealed weapons program for all citizens that are in Humboldt County that uh, are eligible to carry a concealed weapon. We do have a program that we do here at the Sheriff's Office uh, to issue concealed weapons. And, um, and uh, so if you're interested in that, please visit our website and, uh, and everything is online now.